topic uh, that we are going to talk about is multi-location, multi-supplier. And I'm hoping what our esteemed panelists, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them, and you'll wonder why I use the word esteemed. So, and we're going to cover the whole area with a particular attention uh, to Latin America also. So, in this group, I think we have about 50 trips to Latin America in the last 18 months. I think, and I know that there are two good salsa dancers in this group also, wow. but with very mediocre Spanish-speaking skills. <laughs> we'll look at each other. <laughs> All right, so based on that note, but more importantly, let me introduce the panelists first so you can understand kind of their perspective, where they're coming from. Steve Roderham, Steve is leading global transitions for Capgemini, so has a very strong perspective globally and more importantly, also from a Latin America perspective. Uh, the next person we have, Vishal Aluwalia. Vishal is with the Wealth Management Group at UBS. Again, a very strong financial services and a global perspective. And has been in this industry for a very long period of time. I'm fortunate to know him at other events also. Uh, our final but not the least is Ashish Malhotra. Ashish is head of global resources for Citi. And again, a very strong uh, global presence and, of course, experience in Latin America also. And just to kind of give you a little bit of background on mine, um, I've been engaged in Latin America since 1997, and particularly the last three years. For us, which is our business, is now more than 50%, which is the advisory side, is more than 50% in Latin America now. And I think it tells you it's an area that's emerging, it's growing. So the issue is, in the context of multi-location, multi-supplier, what are some of the key issues that we grapple with? So let's talk about in your environment, so maybe representing the buy side, and then Steve, from your perspective on the vendor side, let's talk about how are you enabling a competitive environment even though now you have a selected set of vendors? And from your perspective, when, you, when it comes to you, Steve, why don't you talk about how is it that you make sure you remain competitive, hungry, right? Ashish, you want to kick it off? Yeah, so I, I don't mind doing that, but thank you. <clears throat> and thank you for the introduction, too. So quite a few of the things that we spoke about, I uh, would classify them as pre-transaction, pre-deal, right? And then there are quite a few things that came up as questions are things that you can actually control post-deal. In fact, all of that post-deal, but many of these questions have got to be paid attention to before you even did the transaction. So for example, we have something where we uh, have initiated a process called a sign on the door. And it's not just for our providers, it's also for our captive centers within Citigroup. Right? It simply says all the things you do well. So we create a lot of heat maps, we create a lot of uh, you know, uh, talent mapping, not just from a technical skills perspective, but from a domain perspective. Are you good in cards technology? Are you good in mortgage technology? Things like that. And then we try to channel work that way. Your SOWs, your work orders, a lot of what you put in, if you put in your SOWs, for example, I need six people by the end of March, guess what? Your vendor management is about whether or not you got six people by the end of March. So again, from a pre-deal perspective, you've got to put in some SLAs, performance metric uh, elements, uh, KPIs, that you're going to govern this transaction against, and even at a corporate level. Right? Uh, talent and skill set. You know, what we try to do with that is we force a little bit of that into our contracts. So even things like attrition, there's an element of, uh, you, know, within, you know, within four weeks of replacement, there's a learning curve, so that we, we do actually institute a clause that says if you're learning a replacement that was not due to our cause, a certain number of weeks they will spend on that learning. We're creating a city university, which is a training <coughs> curriculum uh, for all our providers to go through at a minimum. Uh, there's an external certification that we use uh, that's web enabled. Uh, which is actually an industry standard, right? So that before even you get onboarded, uh, there is some kind of a talent uh, approval. Uh, the interesting you know, uh, question over here, I, I thought, was about how do you get these companies to actually interact with each other, especially if they're holding upstream, downstream systems, and they need to actually work with each other? So I think any organization, big, small, when you are looking at a portfolio where your workforce is spread all over the globe, and here we are in Nexus near shore, we are talking of Latin American as a region, right? So you have given a set amount of work to a particular region or a particular vendor, and you have multiple 
multiple vendors, you're looking at a different region, how do you make sure that the sourcing remains competitive, the sourcing is meeting the demands, what demands you have for today and the futuristic demand. And I think the factors which has to be taken into account is compliance, what somebody mentioned, risk mitigation, whether your portfolio is in Bangalore or whether it is in Bogota, the risk mitigation is done. And third, which is very critical and important, is how do you revolve your workforce? I remember when I was in Credit Suisse, we did an exercise where we had people in India, we had people in Philippines, and we had people in Raleigh as well as Latin America, and everything was going fine. Then people asked why there is a need for change when everything is running fine. So the reason for the change is the next gen of offshoring, how do you rationalize your workforce to make it more competitive and make it more useful to your needs and rotate it and being competitive in the market. And vendors, whether they are in China, Latin America, or India, whether they, when they have a foot in the door, they will do things like Ashish also mentor, you know, you put clauses, attrition has to be buffered in, continuous training, city university or UBS university, those things will continue. But the vendors also keep on pushing, we have to push the vendors to meet the demands. Unless they understand your domain, understand, they understand your business drivers, which comes from the business side, and keep on evolving them, and keep on innovating them. I think <coughs> the process of evaluation has to continue. How do you, in multi-vendor environments, two things, first of all, how do you stay competitive? Do you do something specific? And number two, how do you collaborate with the other vendors where you might have a joint initiative? Okay. Um, on the competitive piece, it, I think it's more around how do we provide extra value? We've got the, you know, both of you spoke about the scorecards, and yeah, you've got the standard SLAs, but just to pause on that for a second, the biggest danger we run on these, on when you've got multi-vendors, is when you're not comparing like with like. So there's a, a scorecard that comes out with, let's say, turnaround time for accounts payable, that kind of thing. And you're comparing one vendor with another when, in fact, it's different location, it's different customer, it's different route to market, different process, that kind of thing. And you can fall into the trap of either being too confident that, hey, we're all green and Haha, they're not quite so green, or the opposite way around. So that's one of the, that's one of the traps that, that you've got to watch. But once you've got the scorecards green and you're doing good, then you've got to look at how do you bring value, additional value that isn't in any of the SLAs, SOWs, any of the contracts, but how do you bring value? And that can be productivity, it can be Lean Six Sigma projects, that kind of thing where you're looking more end-to-end -end in the process, not just the piece that you've got as a vendor, but how can we help you further? That's what starts to differentiate you against somebody else. Um, and then the, the collaboration piece, um, I think it's very clear lines of communication, um, very clear uh, guidelines that are put in with the client and make sure the client is very visible to it at all times. So the, the direct one-on-one -on -one is including, it becomes a, a three-way tie with the client. Don't, don't ignore them, make sure you collaborate with them so they can see what's going on as well. So ju just to expand on that from your guys' perspective, which answers the question about interaction, uh, do you see challenges in, this, when, in a multi-vendor environment because you have multiple vendors maybe working on, a, on one task, or I shouldn't say one task, one big project, and if there's challenges, how, how are you guys making sure that they are aligned all in the right direction? So normally, you know, in a multi-vendor scenario, take a testing as an example. Right? So now the way, uh, you know, and I'm talking about where I work, I cannot comment on city or any other place. We are trying to create the center of excellence with one vendor. But again, de-risking is after a certain number of FTE has reached, right? If you're looking for some product integration or development, if two vendors are working together, a set frame of governance is created, right? along with the business, along with the sourcing, along with the procurement, so that you know, every card is on the table and you map it as you progress, right? But yes, you will, if you're a multi-vendor scenario and there is two set of vendors having the same capability and trying to attack the same buyer who wants to source that and they are getting piece of it, 
you, you, you are going to face that problem. So I think the right thing is even before you start that exercise, there is plenty of you know, the, the big cake. You divide it in a way that these things can be avoided. So I, I, I mean, I think if you were to ask me from a vendor governance perspective, what are your top five issues? Getting them to talk and work with each other would not show up. But now focusing on the fact that that is a likely issue, uh, and if I were to try to attribute how that issue arises, it's generally got to do with work breakdown. Right? And again, that's before the deal. If you understand your work breakdown structure before the transaction is done and how you've parsed it out, and you've got a nice racy chart you know, uh, that tells, dis defines roles and responsibilities and the handoffs, you eliminate a lot of that problem before it even becomes a problem. Uh, so I, you know, and maybe it's because city has an element of size and therefore an element of influence. But one of the few things that we did do is firstly our contracts are standard, right? In our contracts there's, you know, specifically uh, language about our representatives. Up to 10% of your workforce on a particular assignment can show up, there are delegates, and they need to be hot seats, ready seats available, right? In that cap center that you've put. So you've got this room, this is all city related people. 10% of the seats need to be available should we give you enough notice that are just ready, they're configured to our desktop. And, and now I can throw in anybody, our own employees or some other vendor's employees that need to collaborate for a period of three months or six months. Right, so we've done a little bit of that uh, ahead. And I think so you can prevent some of this from happening uh, in pre-planning stages and uh, you know, in, in pre-transaction stages. Should the issue arise, I guess we use the, uh, you know, we, we, you know, it's like everybody else. There's a little bit of a carrot and a little bit of a baton where you say you're not getting the next transaction. Yeah. I think it's a good question. You know, Steve, Steve, can I start with you on this, which is talk about as you are working in these multi-vendor environments, multi-locations, um, are you primarily dealing with vendor government organization? How do you engage the business units? Yeah, I was thinking that as these guys were talking, and it, it's critical to have um, some kind of sponsor and dealing with the, the um, the procurement teams within the clients is the worst thing we can do because it's just straight facts and figures to them and there's no relationship there. Certainly within the, the BPO environment we need to be an extension of their operations and where I've seen this you know, multi-vendor um, environment collapse I've seen it with poor management from the client side in that it's pushed down to the it's pushed down to the procurement team they deal with it, here's the scorecard, it's very black and white, and there's no, there's no relationship there. Where it's worked is where there's been a, almost a project sponsor within there that owns it, owns the relationship, and, and owns the, um, the dashboard. And then as you go through this monthly governance or quarterly governance, whatever it is, and you sat at the same table, you can have the dialogue instead of it just being a, a snapshot black and white. So, uh, Please go ahead. Yeah. So, Adul, I think, you know, I, I have been in the sourcing and procurement, and fortunately now I sit in the business. And the sourcing people, they help me to drive this. And I agree with this gentleman, and, uh, you know, you have worked for UBS, that's great. So, I completely agree with you. Scorecards and matrix are just tools which, you know, which are creation to look good in the companies, and they are no follow through. I completely agree with that. But again, if a scorecard and matrix is created, with business unit, the stakeholders, the sourcing, as well as the vendor in hand, and that is created, whether it is on a quarterly basis or whether it's on a yearly basis. So what I have done from a CTB, that is change the bank to run the bank, RTB, we have wealth management as an entity within UBS, and then we have the corporate UBS AG, right? And corporate UBS AG has a global standardized practice. They run their surveys, and they send, you know, Vishal, what do you think about Cognizant? What do you think about Wipro? What do you think about Accenture XYZ? Right? We fill it up and forget it, and there are QBRs. But for the work, what I'm performing, it's very important for me to keep a tab of it, to see the productivity gains for which the said project was offshore or transition or somebody is doing in-house is measured correctly. So I have created something along with my stakeholders, sitting across the table with each one of them, me and my team, and involving the vendor, you know, how this should be measured. And then there is, a, there is a confidential survey which we compile and give it to the senior management. This is what looks three months down the line. This is what's going to look. So after three months, if we have some pointers to take, in the next QBR we will find it. And this is independent of what we do at a corporate level. 
So I Thanks. think that's my take. I think these are, I think these are great uh, lessons, I should say, to keep in mind. I should have a different question for you because you just put me in my place uh, when the last comment you made. If you're asking me what the top five issues are, none of the things I'm asking you are in that list. So let me ask you, what are the top three issues you think I should have been you know, no, I mean, talk, so the issue about the comment that I had made was the issue about vendors speaking to each other. I think they are all eager to do that. They want the client to succeed. I mean, we generally believe that the vendor community wants the client to succeed given adequate amount of direction and supervision. Okay. So that's why I said that that's not a big issue to us. The issues that normally come up have got to come up, you know, there are issues about talent and, and our changing needs their inability to understand the impact of regulatory change in our industry and being able to quickly adapt to that. Why do you think that happens? You know, we, we guys get direction from the regulators and we get it very quick and early. They're not attending the same forums and, and you know, they're not attending the same bodies of information for them to actually get it in that same timely manner. So by the time it becomes effective for us, somebody's still gotta go through and put that in either a BPO process uh, or to put that in a technology system. Somebody's got to develop that spec. And, you know, and, uh, so it's back to, you know, the client saying, I see something coming down the pike. I need to inform you about what's the impact of that on this project. If the client fails to handle that responsibility, the vendor community is actually left a little helpless, right? Because they're not really attending that form. Uh, to get that intel. Right. So I think, I mean, I think the way governance works, I mean, we, we <coughs> differentiate governance at not only at the level, right? There's performance management and financial management for procurement and finance. That's happening at an SOW work order level. There is governance that's happening at the relationship level. So we've got our large providers we do over 400, 500 transactions with. You know, some of our larger providers got more than 10,000 people working for us, right? So it's, it's not happening at, you know, there's governance that's happening at the CIO level. Yeah. That's very different than the governance that happens for a project manager on his project and a team of 50 people that he's driving. So I want, you to th I want you to think about if you're advising either the buy side, one of your partners on the buy side or on the vendor side, and Steve, same for you, if you were advising a vendor or a buyer, what would be the number one issue you would handle pre-transaction and the number one issue you would, you would watch post-transaction to ensure success in a multi-vendor, multi-location environment? Pre-transaction, I think it's important to prepare as a, as a provider adequate amount of information and set of expectations and roles and responsibilities that you need to then communicate with your provider so that there is an agreement not just in what needs to be done, but how it will be done and how it will be measured. And what would be the issue escalation process? What is the governance process? Who does what, you know, who turns to whom? During the transaction, or you know, one thing I try to say is, if you're a uh, if you're a buyer, you've got to remember your vendor is not out to get you. If you're a provider, you've got to remember your buyer or your client is not out to get you, right? So that original trust factor is very important, uh, even if it's your thirteenth transaction. After the uh, there was a comment about rewards and penalties. We don't, you know, we rarely ever have ever instituted any of those, even though they show up in all kinds of contracts. Most of the resolutions actually happen about meeting up the minds, right? There was an issue, something slipped, um, the resources are not right, or the delivery is behind, or the uh, budget is behind. You've really got to work, again as a team, with a common goal and purpose. That so it is minute. inception, Transition, CTB, and then RTB. This is all, you know, how, how you program a, a particular transition, multi-vendor, multi-region, irrespective. I think it's very important to have the transparency right from the beginning. You have to understand the drivers. All the stakeholders have to have the same goal. It has to be a top-down approach. We always say at buyers, oh, this was the fault of vendors. No, it's not true. The fault is sometimes at the buyer's side. So it's very important to have the stakeholder mapping a top-down approach. And you should understand, both parties should understand the change management or the escalation process. Because when a project is being run, there will be changes, there will be changes in the market, there will be changes at the buy side, there will be changes at the vendor side, as the gentleman mentioned. So you have to program that in the project life cycle, how you're going to address those changes. And when the project is in the CTB stage, you have to have a very effective very robust governance, irrespective, you have to, you know, you, you have to ride the whip and make sure everybody is <coughs> participant. And then when you come to the RTB phase, 
you have to look at the SLA and productivity gains, whether it is a five-way annuity, three-year annuity. Is it meeting your needs? Is it meeting how long you can go like this? What the vendor is doing new to innovate and bring about ideas and change? And then you continue further. Great. Um, I think as Vishal said, it was around setting the expectations up front. We touched on the contract, you know, making sure the contract is strong. This is probably more for the client side making sure it's strong so that it is there, but once you refer to it, the relationship is in a pretty bad shape if you've got to go, you know, you've got to go back to the, the contract at that point. So get the expectations set in place and then get that team in place. And you mentioned about going top down, et cetera, but having that project sponsor, who actually owns the relationship as it goes through from the, the setup into the, the actual production time, you've got that, you're an extension of their, their operations, and having the person there to, to go and talk to.